When David confessed his sin in taking Bathsheba and having her husband Uriah killed, the Lord forgave him. Yet as the prophet Nathan had warned, there would be far-reaching consequences of family turmoil. I mean, this is going to become a family feud like you've never seen in your life. It seems to me that David's sons were drawn more to their father's failures than to his faith. We're given the tragic account here in chapter 13 of the brutal sin of Amnon, David's oldest son. Verse 1 sets the stage for us. Now Absalom, David's son, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And after a time, Amnon, David's son, loved her. Now we learn back in chapter 3 that Amnon was the son of David's wife Ahinoam, while the mother of Absalom and Tamar was Macha. So Amnon here is essentially in love with his half-sister, but this love, frankly, is nothing more than lust. Acting on the advice of his cousin, Amnon pretends to be sick, and verse 6 tells us, When the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, Please let my sister Tamar come and make a couple of cakes in my sight, that I may eat from her hand. Now David appears to be rather oblivious to Amnon's deception and the danger to Tamar, and so he instructs her to go to Amnon's house. When Amnon's intentions become clear to Tamar, she pleads with him to speak to their father, King David, and arrange a proper marriage. But Amnon, he's not interested in marriage. He's consumed with lust, and tragically here, he rapes Tamar. Verse 15 tells us that afterward is love, just immediately turns to hate. There's no doubt her, her presence condemns his conscience. He wants her to, to leave him. Well, she tears her robe and puts ashes on her head. This signifies grief over her lost virginity and what it might mean for her future. Well, here in verse 20, her brother Absalom, he finds out about it, and he just kind of quietly takes Tamar over to his house to live with his family, and he begins to plot revenge. Now, verse 21 tells us when David finds out about this, he's angry, but tragically, he doesn't do anything about it. And according to Old Testament law, you need to understand rape called for the death penalty. More than likely, I think David is feeling guilty of his own capital offenses, and and then tragically he does nothing about these. He actually here becomes like Eli, a passive, indulgent father who refuses to discipline his son. Well, Absalom, on the other hand, is waiting. He's going to wait two years for the right moment to take revenge for his sister against Amnon. He invites his father, King David, as well as all of David's sons, to celebrate with him at the time of sheep shearing. He believes the time is ripe for revenge. Now, I agree with those Bible scholars who think that Absalom's invitation to David might very well have been an early attempt to take his father's life as well and seize the throne. David declines this invitation, fortunately. But he allows his sons to all attend this festival, and verse 28 reveals Absalom's plot. Then Absalom commanded his servants, Mark when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say to you, strike Amnon, then you kill him. Do not fear, have I not commanded you? In other words, this is, this is my responsibility, not yours. And just as he planned, his servants carry out his wishes. Now, fearing retaliation, we read here in verse 37 that Absalom fled and went to Talmai, king of Geshur. This was the home, by the way, of his maternal grandfather. And he finds refuge with him for three years until his father's mourning over Amnon finally subsides. Now, at this point, as chapter 14 opens, General Joab steps into the picture. He he understands that 
that David longs to see Absalom, but under the circumstances, he can't just invite his murderous son to return to Jerusalem. Joab is not just a warrior. He's a shrewd politician, and he knows it's, it's not good now for, for Israel. It's not good for the army to suffer through conflict and, and, and tension here in the, in the royal family. So he sets a plan in motion. Verse 2 says this, Joab sent to Tekoa and brought from there a wise woman and said to her, pretend to be a mourner and put on mourning garments. Go to the king and, and speak thus to him. So Joab put the words in her mouth. Well, this woman relates to David a story in which she claims to be a widow and she has two sons, but there's an argument. One son kills the other. Well, now the family wants to take her surviving son and put him to death for murder. She wants her remaining son, you know, protected. He's the, he's the only heir of her late husband's estate. Well, David assures her here with an oath that he will protect her son. And he says to her in verse 11, as the Lord lives, not one hair of your son shall fall to the ground. Well, with that, the woman reveals the whole meaning of her story. In other words, if David is willing to protect a murderer from her family, why won't he grant the same protection to his own son, Absalom, who killed his brother? Well, David immediately suspects that uh, Joab's behind this woman's story, and, well, she confirms it. Instead of getting upset with Joab, however, King David tells him here in, in verse 21, Behold now. I grant this, go and bring back the young man, Absalom. So Absalom returns to Jerusalem now, but he lives in his own house, and David refuses to see him for more than two years. Now, we're given some information that that sets the stage for Absalom's rise in popularity in Israel. It says here in verse 25, Now, in all Israel, there was no one so much to be praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. Well, now, two years go by. There's been two years of absence from the royal court. And Absalom now finally wants Joab to do something about it and intercede on his behalf to his father, King David. Joab just ignores him, brushes him off. So Absalom, verse 30, tells us that he sets Joab's fields on fire to get his attention. And I got to tell you, it worked. With that, Joab goes to David and convinces David to bring Absalom back. And Absalom now comes before the king. He humbly bows with his face to the ground. And chapter 14 ends with this simple statement here. The king kissed Absalom. But now the tragedy here is we still find no recognition of sin. There's no expression of of repentance. There's no desire for reconciliation really on part of either David or Absalom. This kiss is really just a royal formality. What's missing here is a relationship. Family terms like, you know, father and son, they're absent here in the text. This is more like a king-servant relationship, and it isn't going to be long before Absalom is plotting to reverse the roles where he can become Israel's future king. Beloved, these rather tragic chapters in 2 Samuel revealed to us this universal principle that's stated in the New Testament book of Galatians. Whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7. The lust and rape and murder and intrigue and deception, they grew from the seeds sown by David's own adultery, polygamy, murder, and cover up. And perhaps David no longer believes he has any moral authority to discipline his children because of his own sins. Beloved, we don't discipline our children because we're perfect. We don't serve the Lord. We don't do the right thing because we've never failed and maybe even failed miserably. No failure is fatal. Every sin can be forgiven. Let's imitate our perfect heavenly Father who is consistent in discipline, quick to forgive, ready to reconcile. The Apostle John wrote it this way, if we say that we have no sin, 
we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 8 and 9. Let's not forget, yes, there can be consequences to sin, but let's allow them to keep us close to Christ. Let's allow them to keep us in careful obedience. Uh, Let's allow them to, to keep us remembering the cleansing and and the grace we have received through Christ. Well, until our next wisdom journey, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. 